Welcome to a quick note. Today we unravel the enigma that continues to captivate minds, the elusive figure known as Jack the Ripper. Join us as we explore the shadowy streets of Victorian London and attempt to uncover the identity behind one of history's most infamous serial killers. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more quick notes on intriguing topics. Meet Jack the Ripper, a mysterious figure from the past who left a trail of questions in the Victorian era. Back then, life was tough for many people. Lots of folks worked long hours in harsh conditions, like in mines and factories. On top of that, there was a big gap between the rich and the poor, and things were especially tough for the working class. In those days, being a man or a woman made a huge difference. Men got to do all sorts of things, work, get involved in politics, and have active social lives. They had more freedom, even in their personal lives. But for women, it was a different story. They were seen as dependent and had limited opportunities. Being open about their personal lives was often frowned upon. Now let's talk about Jack the Ripper. This guy's a bit of a mystery. No one knows for sure who he was. He's like a shadow from the past. During the Victorian era from August to November 1888, Jack the Ripper committed a series of gruesome crimes. He targeted and killed at least five women, leaving behind a puzzle that still hasn't been solved to this day. Let's dive into the dark deeds of Jack the Ripper and the chilling murders that took place. Between April 1888 and February 1891, a total of around 11 women lost their lives, and it's believed that five of them fell victim to the notorious Jack the Ripper. At first, the mysterious killer went by the name Whitechapel Murderer, but then things took a twisted turn. A letter arrived at the police station, taunting the authorities. The person who wrote it claimed to be the infamous serial killer, boldly signing off as Jack the Ripper. This sinister note marked the beginning of the name we now associate with one of the most infamous figures in criminal history, Marianne Nichols. On the evening of August 31, 1888, a chilling discovery unfolded in a gateway in Bucks Row, Whitechapel. A mutilated body was found, later identified as Marianne Nichols. Mary faced tough times, living in an era without government support, so she turned to prostitution like many others to make ends meet. Mary's friend Emily Holland saw her last alive at around 2.30 in the morning. Mary spoke of needing money for her lodging that night, having spent what she had earlier in the day. Concerned for Mary's vulnerable state, Emily urged her to come home, but Mary, determined to secure her lodging money, refused. Tragically, that was the last time anyone saw Mary alive. As night fell, Mary's lifeless body was discovered. Her throat had been brutally cut back to her spine, a wound so severe it nearly severed her head. An ambulance revealed a deep wound in her abdomen. Mary's funeral took place on September 6, 1888, marking the beginning of investigations into this horrifying event that shook the streets of Whitechapel. Annie Chapman On September 8, 1888, Annie Chapman became the second victim of Jack the Ripper. Like Mary Nichols, Annie faced personal struggles, having recently separated from her husband before his passing. To make ends meet, she turned to crochet work and prostitution as there was little government support for women in her situation. On the evening of September 7th, around 5 p.m., Annie met her friend Amelia Palmer. She mentioned feeling unwell but insisted on going out to earn money for her lodgings. Tragically, her mutilated body was discovered in Hanbury Street around 6 a.m. the next morning. Her younger brother, Fountain Smith, identified her. Annie's funeral took place on September 14th, 1888, shrouded in secrecy to prevent large crowds of curious onlookers, similar to Mary Nichols's funeral. The impact of Annie's murder echoed beyond her tragic end. It compelled society to confront the challenges faced by poor working-class women like Annie, drawing attention to the connection between her death and Mary's, sparking investigations into their plight. Elizabeth Stride Elizabeth Stride, born in Sweden in 1842, made her way to London at around 22 years old. She tied the knot with a man named John Thomas Stride, but sadly separated from him in 1877. Afterward, Elizabeth found herself staying in various lodging homes and doing odd jobs to make ends meet. Her life took a challenging turn, and she earned the nickname Long Liz during her days working as a prostitute. On the evening of September 29, 1888, Elizabeth set out from her lodging house for the night. At 12.45 a.m. on September 30th, a man named Israel Schwartz reported witnessing an attack on Elizabeth by a mysterious-looking man on Burner Street. Unfortunately, Schwartz did not intervene. The discovery of Elizabeth's lifeless body in Louis Duffield's yard near Burner Street prompted a call for help from Duffield, the steward of a nearby club. The police and medical team swiftly responded. Similar to the previous murders, Elizabeth's throat had been cut, but her body was not mutilated. Her death marked what became known as the double event, 
with two murders occurring just hours apart on September 30, 1888. Elizabeth's funeral took place on October 6, 1888, adding another somber chapter to the haunting series of crimes attributed to Jack the Ripper, Catherine Eddowes. Catherine Eddowes, born on April 14, 1842, faced numerous challenges in her life. In the late 1870s, she moved to Westminster with her husband, but personal and financial difficulties soon arose. Catherine had a tough childhood, losing both parents and being separated from several siblings. By 1880, her marriage struggled, leading to her residing in Cooney's common lodging house after parting ways with her husband. In her new lodgings, Catherine met a man named John Kelly, and they moved between different places together. On the day of her tragic murder, Catherine told John Kelly that she intended to borrow money from her daughter to cover her lodging costs that night. Despite Kelly's warning about the Whitechapel murderer, Catherine insisted she could handle herself. The details of that fateful night remain unclear, but at 1.45 a.m., police officer Alfred Watkins discovered Catherine's mutilated body in Mitre Square. Her throat had been cut, similar to previous victims, but there were additional horrifying details. Deep V's cut into her eyelids and cheeks, and her uterus was missing. Catherine Eddowes' funeral took place on October 8, 1888, with a large crowd attending the procession, including her four sisters. Her tragic end added another layer to the gruesome events associated with Jack the Ripper, Mary Jane Kelly. Mary Jane Kelly, the last known victim of the Ripper murders, remains shrouded in mystery. Born in Ireland, she grew up amidst seven brothers and one sister. At the tender age of 16, she married a man named Davis, but tragedy struck when her husband was killed just three years later. Life took a challenging turn for Mary. Introduced to prostitution by her cousin, she moved to London, befriending French women running brothels in Knightsbridge. Mary struggled with heavy drinking and moved between various lodgings. Eventually, she found companionship with Joseph Barnett, but financial struggles arose when he lost his job, leading Mary back to prostitution. On the eve of her death, Mary was seen by several people, including George Hutchinson. Desperate for money, she approached him, but he had nothing to spare. Later, she was seen with a man on a commercial street. Around 4 a.m., neighbors heard commotion, but dismissed it as a drunken argument. The grim discovery came around 10.45 a.m. the next day, prompted by a landlord's attempt to collect rent. The scene was beyond description, with Mary Jane Kelly's body horribly mutilated, little more than a skeleton remained. Despite the gruesome sight, her funeral took place on November 19, 1888. The police, doctors, and even a photographer delved into the investigation, making Mary Jane Kelly's murder one of the earliest documented crime scenes. The details of her tragic end add a haunting chapter to the dark tale of the Ripper murders. The Jack the Ripper investigation presented an extraordinary challenge for the police during its time. The killer left scant clues and the crimes unfolded in one of the most crime-ridden areas of London. Adding to the difficulty, the investigation lacked many of the modern police techniques we take for granted today. Fingerprinting and advanced forensics, standard tools in today's investigations, were not available at that time. Compounding the challenge, the Ripper murders did not attract much media attention, a factor that could have been advantageous in the modern era. During the Victorian period, the police held the belief that limiting journalists' access and involvement would prevent criminals from learning the details of their investigation. This approach, while well-intentioned, might have inadvertently contributed to the limited progress in solving the Ripper mystery. The infamous name Jack the Ripper emerged following a letter received by the police on September 27, 1888. The letter, written in a boastful tone and addressing the police as the boss, initially raised skepticism about its authenticity. However, the atmosphere changed when, shortly after receiving the letter, two more women, Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, were tragically murdered. The timing of the murders prompted the police to re-examine the letter, which now carried ominous clues related to these crimes. The letter stated, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. This unsettling connection between the letter and the subsequent murders intensified the mystery surrounding Jack the Ripper and heightened the sense of urgency in the police investigation. The Jack the Ripper investigation witnessed a significant development with the resignation of Sir Charles Warren following the murder of Mary Jane Kelly. Warren, a notable figure and accomplished military commander, led the Metropolitan Police with a firm adherence to principles. Despite his success, the Ripper murders placed him under intense scrutiny, becoming a target for criticism from discontented commentators and journalists who voiced concerns about the police's inability to apprehend the murderer. Warren's liberal stance often led to disagreements with the conservative Home Secretary, further complicating his position amidst the mounting criticisms. 
The challenging circumstances and relentless pressure eventually led to his resignation from the Jack the Ripper investigation, marking a turning point in the pursuit of the elusive killer. Before the tragic murder of Mary Jane Kelly, Sir Charles Warren had already faced intense criticism in the press, stemming from his role in the protest known as Bloody Sunday. This event resulted in the deaths of two individuals and the hospitalization of a hundred more, with 77 police constables and 40 protesters arrested. Despite some viewing Warren as a hero for quelling a potential revolt, the press criticized him for perceived excessive brutality, leading to a shift in public sentiment and growing discontent. As the search for Jack the Ripper unfolded, public fear intensified, and frustration with the police mounted due to their inability to apprehend the elusive murderer. One newspaper expressed the prevailing sentiment, stating, It is impossible to exaggerate the utter want of confidence in the whole police system which this frightful tragedy has evoked, and if sheer fright grows into crazed fury, we shall hold Mr. Matthews and Sir Charles Warren responsible. The public's growing anger and lack of confidence in the authorities added another layer of challenge to the Jack the Ripper investigation. Contrary to a common misconception, Sir Charles Warren's resignation was not directly prompted by the murder of Mary Jane Kelly. In fact, he had sought to resign on several occasions before, but each attempt was denied. The approval for his resignation had actually been granted the day before Mary Jane Kelly's tragic murder. Warren, weary of the relentless criticism and strained relations with Henry Matthews, the Home Secretary, found these factors influential in his decision to resign. He conveyed to the press that weak political leadership played a significant role in the police's perceived failure in the Jack the Ripper investigation. The culmination of criticism, strained relationships, and political dynamics ultimately led to Warren's decision to step down from his role. The enigma of Jack the Ripper's identity continues to baffle investigators, with numerous suspects proposed over the years, each accompanied by their own theories. One notable figure among these suspects is Montague Druitt, a barrister with a troubled history. Another candidate is Thomas Cutbush, a mentally unstable and violent individual, and Aaron Kosminski, a Polish immigrant who spent time in an asylum. Montague Druitt emerged as a potential suspect due to his death in the River Thames shortly after the Ripper's final murder. Some speculated that he might be the elusive killer, although there was a lack of substantial evidence. Born on August 15, 1857, Druitt was dismissed as a suspect by some, with theories suggesting that his suicide was driven by factors unrelated to the murders, such as his homosexuality. Crucially, on the day of the first murder, he was playing cricket in Dorset, miles away from the crime scene in Whitechapel, casting doubt on his involvement in the Jack the Ripper case. Thomas Cutbush, a medical student with a troubled history, has been considered as a potential Jack the Ripper suspect. Sent to Lambeth Infirmary due to delusions thought to be linked to syphilis, Cutbush attempted to stab a woman during his time there. Following this incident, he was committed to Broadmoor Hospital in 1891. Although articles by The Sun suggested Cutbush as a Ripper suspect, there is no evidence to indicate that the police took these claims seriously. Another individual in the Jack the Ripper suspect list is Aaron Kosminski, a Polish Jew admitted to Colney Hatch Asylum in 1891. Kosminski became a suspect because the only witness who claimed to have a good view of the killer identified him immediately upon seeing him. Aaron also matched the description of a sexual maniac, as reported by the witness. Speculation at the time suggested that the murderer and associates were low-class Polish Jews, aligning with Aaron's background. While the investigation lacked sufficient evidence to convict Kosminski at the time, recent documentaries and theories, including the BBC's Jack the Ripper, The Case Reopened, have pointed to Aaron Kosminski as a likely suspect. Throughout the investigation, over 100 individuals were considered as potential suspects in the enduring mystery of Jack the Ripper. The actions of Jack the Ripper and the notorious murders have left a lasting imprint on history, resonating with us even today. Several intriguing aspects contribute to the enduring impact of Jack the Ripper. 1. Cultural significance. The Jack the Ripper case holds cultural importance shaping societal perceptions and sparking discussions around criminal investigations. The gruesome nature of the murders and the mystery surrounding the killer have fueled public fascination for over a century. 2. Serial Killer Phenomenon Jack the Ripper is often considered one of the earliest examples of a serial killer. The case played a pivotal role in the emergence of the term serial killer and heightened awareness of this chilling phenomenon and its psychological dimensions. 3. Inspiration for Literature and Media the enigma of Jack the Ripper has inspired a multitude of books, movies, and TV shows. Creators draw from the Ripper case to delve into themes of mystery, horror, and the darker facets of history.
this cultural resonance continues to captivate audiences worldwide. For Forensic Science Limitations, the Ripper investigation highlighted the significant limitations of forensic science during that era. This realization prompted discussions and reforms in policing and forensic methods, pioneering the development of criminal investigation practices that form the basis of modern forensic science. In summary, Jack the Ripper's impact extends beyond the historical timeline, influencing societal perspectives, discussions on criminal investigations, and contributing to the evolution of forensic science and policing methods that we rely on today. The case remains a compelling and influential chapter in the exploration of mystery, crime, and the human psyche. As we wrap up our exploration of who was Jack the Ripper, here on A Quick Note, we hope you found our journey through history both fascinating and thought-provoking. If you enjoyed this quick dive into the mysteries of the past, give us a thumbs up, subscribe for more content, and hit the notification bell to stay updated. Until next time, this has been A Quick Note, your shortcut to the most intriguing stories throughout history.